Well, well, this is a special occasion for the AI Institute. Uh, this is the first PhD defense. Um, as in the previous center, uh, it's a very important event in the life of uh, an organization as our uh, probably the most important product is our PhD students. And so today, Manas has that distinction of uh, uh, doing the first defense. Um, uh, we're delighted we have an excellent um, uh, committee and um, also his defense is on a major topic that is uh, uh, a, a significant topic for uh, what we are doing today in the Institute. Um, Manas has done quite a bit of uh, work and uh, has a lot of publications. So uh, we worked hard uh, to ensure that he only presents a uh, meaningful subset of it to make it uh, fit uh, the time that we have. So with that, Manas, on to you. So, uh, hello everyone. Uh, thank you, Dr. Shet, for the kind introduction. And, uh, okay. Yes. Okay, uh, so those for those who don't know much about me, I want to give a brief introduction. Uh, I have received my training in computer science, and then after I went for my software engineering master's degree, uh, where I, I earned a specialization in artificial intelligence. And I wrote my first paper on meta heuristic algorithms that motivated me for the research. Thereafter, I worked with various research centers on very familiar topics on computational neuroscience, network theory, data mining, and machine learning. Up until spring of 2016, when I met Dr. Sheth and I became his advisee. And uh, throughout my PhD journey, one thing I have repeatedly heard from him is that you need to work harder than he does. And I hope I did this. And indeed, it has worked the best for me. So I'm glad to have his uh, optimism, his wisdom, his sense of creativity, and his support. And on, those, on that note, I proudly present my thesis, Defense on Knowledge-Infused Learning. Uh, this starts with a simple goal of using human knowledge to make AI explainable and interpretable. Sorry. Uh -huh. yeah, just move it on the side. Click on it and then move it on the side. Yeah. Oh. Okay. So it starts with a simple goal on using human knowledge to make AI interpretable and explainable. The, re the reason it's a simple goal because we are trying to utilize what's existing in the world, the human knowledge. The human knowledge occurs in various forms and essentially statistical AI or the AI as a stance do not integrate that. So essentially what we are trying to achieve is to integrate these broader forms of knowledge into statistical AI framework, which are already there and working very well to make them more interpretable and explainable. And this also aligns to the next generation neurosymbolic AI, which tries to investigate the duality between the data and knowledge. So this goal and vision has a very strong adaptation to the DARPA's perspective where the last phase is on contextual adaptation, which is very close to the idea of user level explanations. So where I, when we stand at statistical AI, as is currently, it's a black box. Why do we consider at, is that a black box is because of the various reasons. The reasons are like the AI doesn't, doesn't capture the context, which is very much important in the text. Forget about the text. It's even important in the computer vision program as well. The AI doesn't handle uncertainty or makes a wrongful predictions in uncertain cases. User level explanations are, are very much important. And as we know that 91% of the companies require explainability in all of their products. And, it's, and the success and the failure of an AI model cannot be explained as to what went wrong inside the hood. The third point is about the control of an AI. Can we control the internal mechanics of the AI model and make it more interpretable? And in result, can we make AI in a format that is self-explainable in itself? 
Now this AI system, what I what we call as system one, as uh, as the propellant of uh, deep learning and AI uh, says, what we investigate is that a synchronization between system one and system two, where system two is about human knowledge, the knowledge which is openly available. They exhibit in various forms like documents, like books, even the web forums are all sort of different forms of knowledge. We want to integrate them together to make a system that is user level explainable. Right, I will talk about what is exactly the knowledge graph, but that's a very fascinating invention to understand how knowledge can be integrated into an AI framework. There's a history behind of, of integrating this knowledge, starting from John McCarthy's in 1968, when he talked about the philosophical problems of the current AI and why knowledge is required in the computing. To 2019, when Gary Marcus identified that AI needs a hybrid approach that brings together AI and knowledge. This knowledge graph is a consist, is, it lies in a very centric point among all of these history uh, descriptions. It's a machine readable format that is seamlessly integrated, okay, that can be seamlessly be integrated into the AI framework. That at, at, uh, at a simple point or in an atomic level, a knowledge graph's component lies in a subject, predicate, and object, which if you can see is a World War I fought with poisonous gas. So that's a kind of a triple, and many powerful triples can be formed in the knowledge graph. They occur in various forms, like Wikidata, which is your uh, Wikipedia. Empathy is an ontology to study crisis informations. ConceptNet about the common sense, and WordNet about the linguistic vocabularies. This alone knowledge graph is a very powerful mechanism to understand open domain questions. You can simply get an answer simply using the search and the retrieve methods of knowledge graph. But AI comes in handy because it has a power to exploit patterns. So how do we connect these two is what this defense is all about. And it's interesting example, as you have been very much familiar with, is the IBM Watson joining hands with DVPedia to solve the Jeopardy challenge. Over the time, there have been very extensive research along the integration of knowledge in the AI framework to make uh, things explainable. Now, coming back to the series of questions that people were raising about the context capture, the uncertainty situation, user level explainability, interpretability, and self-explainability. I turn these questions into my assessors for my defense. And I consider that let's take a statistical AI framework, see where it stands and what improvements we can make to make the AI more explainable and interpretable. To do this, I have, a, I may define my scope. Not all of the scope would be covered in the defense, but I will travel my level best to cover everything. So my data stats starts from social media, covering Reddit, Twitter, mm -hmm. clinical diagnostic interviews, clinical notes, and heterogeneous dialogue data sets. Along all of these data sets, I have investigated two specific paradigm within a statistical AI called classification models and generative models. As we stand in the AI currently in the natural language understanding, a simple phenomenon of how it happens is that you have, you take a very good working attention neural network or any deep learning model. You give it a large amount of data. You have the power of GPU resources. You train over the weeks to get a trained model. What essentially you're getting is just word co-occurrences. The model learns the similarity between the words. That's word co-occurrence probabilities. You can replace this model with various other foundational models that have been built over the time. And essentially, you can actually exercise this various phenomena by, but at a centric level, all of these learns word co-occurrences. Let's just put these things into practice. Let's take these two examples about World War I and World War II. We, as you can see very easily, that these two sentences are very much different. But let's put these some, uh, sentences to a model. Model get, generates a representation. You can visualize that representation using attention maps. And what you get is a sentence, you communicate, you ca calculate a similarity. The similarity says that the, these two sentences are similar. Most importantly, the reason is World War I and World War II occurs very frequently together and they are the one and two are the major point that defines this context which the model is not able to capture how about i just add a small piece of information to this sentence i add some set of triples which tells me what world war one was 
it and how it is differentiating from World War II. I generate a new set of representation by adding this information. I do this for another sentence, the World War II sentence, and generates the two representations. And when I looked at these two representations and compute their similarity, they came out to be different. And with this simple trick of adding just extra piece of information on an entity that differentiate two sentences, and across scaling across all the factors, you almost get 3% improvement in your performance, which is spectacular compared to the BERT model, which doesn't capture the context sensitivity. But that's not what I'm uh, worried about, and that's not what, why it's important to me. What's important to me is that it's able to capture the context. It's able to se separate World War I and World War II. Let's look at it into a format which is very much critical, the complex information environment. Suppose you have two posts, and these two posts are talking about jihad, which is one of the most critical concepts in social media, the radicalization process. Now, if you look at the left, the one in the green, that talks about a very positive connotations, and one in the red is about, the, is about a more extremist or one like violent activity. I, we know that we label it as non-extremist and extremist, and when we put the model, it labels both of them as extremist, which is a pretty much uh, a complicated task because if a non-extremist is labeled as extremist, there's a uh, consequence associated with it. And that's why such a uh, process is not desirable. And that's why we need a context sensitivity in the model. Now let's look at these two posts again. We know that they are one is religious or one is positive, another is a negative aspect. But I understood that the, the one in the green is very much religious oriented. The one in the red is more like about the hate. So we analyze them from these independent domain specific corpus. We, we train a model on independent corpuses. One is on religion, one on ideology, and one on hate independently. And we pass these posts through, that, through those three models as a, like an independent fashion. So what we get is that we get representation, one for the green post, one for the red post. We show them on the uh, projection, on a, on a visualization. We see that there is a distinction between how the green post looks like, which are more uh, uh, religious and more positive. And we know what red post looks like, which are more uh, violent and hate oriented. We look deeper into these clusters by looking at what these clusters look like. These clusters, as you can say, they are basically representations, numerical representations. Definitely, that means they represent some concept. You can map this information to the concept, connect them to label that particular cluster. So you can understand that jihad in one red was a different in the jihad in another concept, in the, another context. So this is what I taught, uh, which I'm talking about as context understanding. With this approach of bringing all these three models together, you are able to get 94% improvement or 94% achievement in your recall. And this is spectacular. There is a decline, if you can see, in the, between hate and ideology because the religious related concepts were not captured at this point. But if you put these, all these models together, you gather that, that distinction between what is positive and what is negative. So this is why context sensitivity is very critical in knowledge infused learning to and specifically in my defense. And now let's move it. So, so far I talked about the classification task, which is very much important. Let's look at the generative task. The process remains the same. You have the model, you have the data, you change the data to make it more conversational oriented, and you get a trained model that is more generative in nature. That means it can generate sentences, it can generate poems, it can generate paragraphs, whatever. So when you have this model, you put it into use. How do you use it? You use in a conversational setting. You have a model interact with a person. And the model generates a series of questions. These questions, if you see the first one, do you feel irritated or self-destructive? This word self-destructive is not plausible, is not realistic. That means that a clinician would never ask a person, do you feel self-destructive? Or you will, not, you will not ask a person, are you able to relax? Rather, you will be more looking at the problems that the person is suffering from. That means these questions are not relevant or either they are risky. So that means that such questions should not be generated by the model. But let's look at what's happening under the hood of these models. So we take this uh, same scenario. 
And what we add to it is a small sanity check. The model does a sanity check in the middle of its generation to its to the point when it shows the questions to the audience uh, to its uh, to the customer. It checks the whether the generated question matches a safety lexicon or not, and whether the generated question matches a medical questionnaire or not. If it is, then the generated questions are medically valid and they are safe. Now, in this process of generating questions, you can check whether those questions were mapped to those question, those lex lexicons and questionnaires, getting your sense of user level explainability, right? And subsequently, you will gather the model interpretation because if the model doesn't matches or doesn't verify to these safety lexicons, definitely it will not generate any questions. So you can look into under the under the hood of the model to understand what's happening. Why is it not matching these uh, lexicons or medical questionnaires? So with this addition of safety checks, we already made the model 65% safer than the baseline models. The models, so in all of my cases, I'm already taking the state of the art AI models. I'm not generating any new AI models. What I'm trying to do is finding better ways of integrating the knowledge into the AI framework. So with that addition, I'm able to get 65% better and more safer generation than the state of the art. Now let's happening what the safety, safety checks looks like. The safety checks are nothing but a process. That means it, it, I'm telling the model that if you are generating the current question as cause, then the next question generated needs to be of symptoms. If the current question is about symptoms, then the next question has to be about medication and so on and so forth. So it's just like a bunch of case statements that you're putting inside the model, which is fairly possible. You have a conditional way of integrating information into the AI framework to make it more interpretable and explainable. So with this approach, I'm able to handle uncertainty in the model. That means my model now knows when the generation is safe and when the generation is not safe. Now I looked, I showed you two aspects of statistical AI and suggested some improvement. And the hood, uh, as it stands as an AI framework, the classification and generation, they do not, they are not context sensitive and they do not handle uncertainty or risk. What's the underlying cause of it? Is the underlying cause is that the training process the model undergoes and it involves human annotations. And a human annotators requires various forms of knowledge that it uses to label your data set, but that information is not available to the model. They are not available at the output, they're not available inside the model. That means that these series of information, if integrated inside the model, then I call it interpretability. If they are being um, available outside the model, I'm calling it user level explainability. That means I can match the outcomes. But there's a trick over, there's a conscious point over here that these information, though available at large, you cannot bring all together into the model. You cannot bring all the information at the output because that's a kind of a very cumbersome and a tedious task. So what we essentially do is that we replace it with something that machine can understand and we keep on improving it over the time. We can add more information to it and let's start with a very basic format, which is a knowledge graph. We take a knowledge graph, a knowledge graph looks like a very graphical structure with nodes and entities and have some relationships. And we bring them, uh, bring that information. That graph has a numerical representation. You can compute some numerical values for that graph. You bring that information, you put it into the model. That's where you can get an interpretability because you can tune these inter this injection or this infusion of the model inside, in sorry, infusion of the knowledge inside the model. And you can explain it because what you're adding to it, you need that as an outcome. You match it with what you're getting as an outcome. So with this information, as of now, the, the standing that we have is that statistical AI is, there is, this, there is some examples of very general language understanding, which are not very much important to context sensitivity. So I'm putting a question mark saying that some examples it can do very well if you have large data mm -hmm. and do it. But some critical cases like complex information environment, as an example I showed in the radicalization, the things are not as context sensitive as it seems. Handling uncertainty and risk, you can do that in various other applications, but in NLP, the risk association associated with a complex environment is still questionable. Interpretability and user level explainability has never been thought about as a centric piece of the statistical AI. It's currently undergoing a transition phase and I appreciate this knowledge infused learning is way to go forward. With this, I proudly present my thesis statement on knowledge infused learning, which is a class of neurosymbolic AI that tries to integrate the broader forms of knowledge, 
that are lexical, domain specific, common sense and constraint based into a computational framework to make the model more interpretable as well as user level explainable. So in short, it's all about integrating data and knowledge. It's a duality of data and knowledge into a statistical AI framework. I will be talking about two specific types of knowledge infused learning, which I have built over the time. One is a shallow infusion where I'm talking about navigating the black box from outside. And the other is a semi deep infusion where I'm talking about navigating the black box from inside. Over the time, I made significant contribution along these lines of semi deep and shallow infusion. I will not be talking about all of them, but I will be talking about three specific aspects which are very centric known as optimization, loss functions, and evaluation metrics. And along these lines, there is, you need data sets. When you, lead, when you look at data sets, the very famous data sets that comes into the natural language understanding problem is a glue data set, which is general language understanding evaluation. Such data sets do not challenge explainability and interpretability. And essentially, what I built as a part of my the PhD is a new class of tests known as knowledge intensive language understanding. These are what I so show you on the y axis are the glue tasks and what I show you on the x axis are the tasks that I made under the framework of KILU. There's a distinction between these two because KILU challenged the AI for explainability and interpretability. And these data sets are very rich because they utilize domain specific knowledge. They have rich evaluation metrics unlike accuracy and precision and all of our, in all of our, uh, the models that you have built or that I have built over in these data sets, they have utilized knowledge in order to achieve state of the art performance. I, while I'm discuss, will be discussing more about these data sets, the most important thing is that these data sets have various domains. They are going from classification to generations, which are the two major prospect of my defense. In specific, I will be talking about knowledge infusion for suicide risk classification. That's one of the classification tasks. And other is a knowledge infusion for language generation. Now, the first thing is that why am I interested on suicide risk classification? A very obvious answer is it's a complex information environment. But the most important thing is that individuals who are actually seeing clinicians in day to day basis, they conceal their thoughts and those informations are available on social media. That means um, I get more information on social media that I can get from a, uh, a assessing a clinical health records. And if you look at suicide watch alone, which is the uh, main central piece of the suicide risk classification, it has more than 300,000 subscribers. But that's not the point. That's a periphery of the problem. The most important problem is that when the models are built to do the suicide risk classifications, they are not clinically grounded. They are not explainable. That means when you when you get a classification, you don't know how that classification came from. What you get at the end is a probabilistic vector you can, which you cannot explain. Let's see that into a uh, through an example of what's happening. This is a post that I took from a famous uh, uh, University of Maryland suicide, suicidality data set. I look at this data set from an annotator's perspective. I highlight these pieces of information. If you look at these pieces of information, they are hopelessness. Diagnosed with borderline, isolate myself, sleep forever. Definitely, the person is having some side of some thought of suicidal uh, suicidal thoughts about uh, or having suicidal ideations. I gave it a person a moderate risk, but when I look at into the model, these terms are not highlighted. As a result, the most of the terms that are highlighted are hopelessness and restlessness, which are very much re 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 related to the concept of low risk. The reason is because they are. If you look at, I will show you. If you look at these two terms, hopelessness and restlessness, they are very much assigned to anxiety and fear, which is not, you can connect that to a suicidality, but that's a long chain. So with this model, I get 53% recall, which means that 46, 47% of the time, I'm not able to give a correct classification to a person. That means if a person is having suicidal behavior or attempt, I'm giving it suicidal ideation or suicidal indications, which is a detrimental. What if I make a very complicated model? I bring a complicated model like CNN that I, if you look at the more CSVM did not capture betrayal, CNN captured betrayal. So what if I if I'm bringing a complicated model and it's getting me some new phrases to be captured, the improvement is still there, but the task that this particular post is still not 
captured. It's still being given as a low risk. A very uh, ingenious technology. It's about gambler's loss. Gambler's loss tells me that whatever information I'm not able to classify, I collect them and give it to the human annotators, let them annotate and give it back to the model again. That means the gambler loss identifies which part of your host can be classified by the model and which are the particular part of the post that it cannot classify. And there's an interesting thing. If you do that, there's an upper bound to this classification, which is 74% or 75%. That means some of the cases or some of the information it will definitely not classify and it will give it to the uh, annotators to classify. It's a very interesting strategy to as a workaround, but that doesn't solve the problem. So what's, what I did was, I looked at some of the concepts in a clinical questionnaire or some resource that an experts use. I took Columbia suicide severity rating scale, which is one of the popular uh, clinical authorized method to understand suicide risk in an individual. But interestingly, when I look at these, this data set that I was working on, I look at these labels, no risk, low risk, moderate risk, and severe risk. These labels do not have definitions. That means they are subject to variable interpretations and variable explainable. So you cannot say that a model, a model is doing moderate risk, it is good enough uh, model. What if, what, if, what if the model is not able to justify why is it going for a moderate risk? What I did was I replaced these labels into more clinically grounded labels called social indications, ideations, behavior, and attempt. If you look at these labels, these labels have some definitions associated with it, which I wrote by the, uh, the, the, the D underscore C. That means that every label has some definitions, has some concepts. That means I can label them what I consider them as a concept classes, because now I know what exactly they mean in real world. I took that same post. I know what annotator's perspective looks like. And I ran through uh, the same post through this concept phrases. When I say I ran through, that means I try to find a bracket within the post. That means which of the phrases are occurring in these concept classes. Is there any similarity between the definitions that I have for these concept classes and the text that I was processing? When I looked at it, I see that, for example, sleep forever occurs together in, in, the, in this concept classes. That means, what does it mean? It means to me that I can generate the representation of these phrases as together, not an individual word, which I was doing earlier. As a result, I was able to get a better uh, indication of what this post looks like, which is indication and ideations. So what happened is when I took this model, or when I took this post, I know what individual phrases look like. I have to pass it through a CNN. But what I did, I only introduced the labels from outside. I introduced the labels from outside and I improved my text, but I didn't bring that information into the model. That means my model's outcome is still doing low level, uh, no, no risk, low risk, moderate and high risk. What I have to do is I have to replace that low risk, moderate risk to these labels. So this is what I'm showing over here is that these are the labels that are coming from the suicide risk severity questionnaire. And essentially what I do is that I compute a, a semantic embedding loss. The loss is basically that these representation that you're seeing at the output layer gets, it's, uh, uh, the, the model tries to generate or calculate the distance between these representations and the representation of these uh, definitions. That means it will check which of the most labels are very close to each other based on their definitions. So when I do this, I'm able to get some of the uh, uh, value or some of the phrases being highlighted. And if you see that just uh, can't take it anymore came together because I gave it together in the model. That's why I'm getting the same, I'm, I'm getting the same uh, highlight over that particular phrase. And most interestingly, I get a probabilistic vector which I can interpret, which is a, a vector which shows me that societal indication is 31% being shown in the post and 63% it is societal ideation. That means that I can label this person social ideation, which is very much similar to the moderate risk. So with this approach, you are, I have achieved the state of the art at present. This is the most uh, acceptable and most widely used model of suicide risk classification, achieving a state of the art recall of 84% with semantic embedding loss. But let's back to the, what is user level explainability in this process? This is very interesting and that's what I was actually fascinated about. It says that, you know, uh, that we have identified these 
phrases over here isolate myself sleep forever and so on and so forth i put them into as my leaf notes right they are my leaf notes sleep forever abandoned and so on and so forth and i pass them through a knowledge graph in this case since it's the medical information i pass it through snomad ct and icd10 those are the prominent knowledge graph processes and trust me when i say that this search and retrieve process takes approximately a fraction of the second time to, uh, to, uh, to construct such a graph you traverse that you found that sleep forever is associated with feeling suicidal abandoned is associated with feeling abandoned and feelings of betrayal is associated with lack of trust if you move further up in the hierarchy you come up with social isolation there is certainly a connection between betrayal and social isolation but isolate myself is also connected to the social social isolations and these all information has a, a spectacular root node which is emotional state if you crawl up up the hierarchy you go to the mental state finding that means that the root node of all of these information is mental state if I have reached the parent node, I can traverse back to other of its siblings. I did a multi hop traversal, it goes to the disturbance in thinking. And then when I do a further multi hop traversal, I go to the suicidal thoughts. And you know what? Now the question is where do I stop? I stop at the label which is defined in my output, which is ideation, indica indication, ideation, behavior, and attempt. If I hit on that point at certain point when I'm traversing, that's where I stop my traverse on the graph and traverse the path to make it user level explainable. And when I see this, this is there is a connection between feeling suicidal and suicidal thoughts and there's a strong connection that explains my user level explainability in this process now i introduce another thing this is user level explainability what if my I know my model is giving a prediction which them which the annotators themselves are not aware of that means i'm i'm, I'm explaining i'm explaining my outcome but what if certain cases as i told about the gambler loss some of the cases that where the model generates an outcome, but it doesn't match with the annotators. So I need to make some kind of edits to that. I introduce a new metric called uh, perceived risk measure, which is explainability as a metric. This equation, as you see on the top is a misclassification calculation that how many times the risk predicted by the model does not match with the true risk. But on the bottom part, I'm also checking about the annotators disagreement. If the annotators disagree at that point, that means my model is also is not difficult for a model to get uh, get an outcome correctly as similar as the annotators. If you look further, but I do need to uh, give a model a thumbs up if it is in agreement with some of the predictions with the annotators. So I need to have a, two of these factors to calculate the risk my model is at right now. And this is what I consider, considered as a PRM, which is a product of these two information. One is the annotator's disagreement and one is the annotator's agreement. With this approach, I'm, I'm able to get a model with 50. So now with the model with concept classes, I tested this on the same baseline as well. And with SVM, it is 61%. But when I'm looking at the concept classes and the semantic embedding loss, the risk measure is drastically down. Basically, the information that I have given outside the model was seamlessly integrated and accepted. And the risk is still is substantially minimized. Now, the interesting thing is that I talked about you, I talked about the all the four classes, the indication, ideation, behavior, and attempt, but I missed about one class, the no risk class. If I give a label to a no risk class, that means no risk is not simply no risk. A person who is supportive online is a no risk person as well. He might be sharing his experiences. What if you just don't label at no risk, but rather give him a label known as supportive label. If I do that, my model understands that information as well and give it a further reduction in the risk. That means if you have concept classes at an outcome and you integrate them with definitions in your model, your model is much, much less riskier and it is explainable. So with this approach, what I achieved is that my model is context sensitive because I'm able to focus on the definitions. I'm able to make the model handles uncertainty and risk because I'm able to measure the risk measure of how many times the generated measure do not match or match with annotators agreement. But I'm also also talked about user level explainability to the extent that's possible and i haven't talked about interpretability in its complete sense because interpretability is all about navigating the black box from inside and that's the next step when i'm actually trying to crack open the black box to get an information what exactly the model looks like from inside we all know ai models no matter where which models we pick them learn by similarities you learn by similarity by word by word, which is the self-correlation or self-attention. 
you learn by similarity sentence by sentence, which is also self correlation and self attention. But what I'm interested in is, is the similarity between user level posts and the concept classes, the classes that I introduced in the previous section. I want them to be integrated inside my model. That means I, my model needs to learn such a matrix. How do we learn this such a matrix? Assume that you have an input post, you have the concept classes over here, and essentially the, you want to learn such a matrix. The best and the simplest way of doing that in a, in a statistical AI framework are autoencoders. Auto Autoencoders are very special form of uh, representation learners and they are representation modulators as well. And what essentially they do is that you give encoders, at the encoder side you give an input, your input post, and out on the decoding side, you give the concept class with the definitions. And essentially the model tries to learn this weight matrix, which do the mapping from the input to the output. And this representation of the W is what you will multiply with your inputs representation to give a modulated representation. And that's why I'm saying the autoencoders are good representation modulators. Now, once you have this matrix, now this uh, autoencoders, interestingly, they have a very uh, fascinating uh, equation which is nothing but minimizing the distance between the two embedding spaces. Ri and Rk are the two embedding spaces. Ri represents post by post uh, correlation matrices, which is self-attention matrix. Rk is a concept by concept or concept classes by concept classes, self-attention matrix. And Ri minus Wk, is, are, they are just, if you look at it in a very simple sense, they are linear projections. They are computing the distance between the two embedding spaces. And what the model is learning is that if I go, if I learn from input to the output, I should learn from the output to the input as like a bidirectional process. If I do this, this equation turns out to be a very simple equation of the form AW plus W delta B of uh, one plus delta of C. That means that this equation, if you look at it, this is nothing but a linear equation in its form. They are just have a linear core, the A and B are your variables. W, R is linear core regression coefficients or coefficients. And the one plus delta C is also a coefficient for the correlation matrices. So if you look at this equation more precisely, then the delta is a very important factor over here. That means that this delta in this uh, associated with B, and if you see B, B is a knowledge, or sorry, B is the input, which is associated with like with the delta. If I can tune the deltas, I can check how much knowledge infusion I, to, I have to make. That means, in order to make this model, uh, in order to make this equation convertible, if you want to make this equation, okay, okay, sorry. So uh, this tunable parameter delta is very interesting. It will allows you, in order to uh, make a convergence into this equation, if you reduce your delta, if you improve your delta, if you tune your deltas the knowledge will come into the picture of your, uh, of your equation. That means if you lower the, co uh, the co concept or if you lower the information in your inputs, you get more information coming from the knowledge because it has to balance the two things. Let's look at it. We have the same post coming from the user who was identified as suicide risk. And when I look at by, by putting my delta 0.84, that means I'm lowering my delta. That means my knowledge is coming through. I have some highlighted uh, uh, highlighting test being identified, which my model identified that this is important to label the person as suicide risk of a particular class. Right now, also the label is not coming out correct. The label is still is in disagreement. If I add more knowledge onto it, because I'm adding knowledge, that means there's a disagreement coming in. I add more knowledge of 29% into the model. I have more highlighting of the phrases. If I keep on adding to the 34%, and that's where I see that most of my information, that means 34% of the information was infused into the model to get the desired results. And the output that you're getting, I think it's highly hydrated, uh, but it's uh, the agreement that I'm, that I'm getting is uh, close to 84%. So this was an expert agreement. And for the expert agreement, what we did was we trained this model in this particular fashion. We gave uh, the, uh, we took that 100 random posts from that model's generation, and we gave it the, to the annotators to see around like 15 to 20 annotators who are experts in this domain. They evaluated the system and they said that we agree 84%. So the agreement that we got was approximately to the 84%. And this has been used extensively in various research over the time. Uh, uh, and I have been, uh, uh, been identified for, for this particular uh, uh, concept of semi, uh, semantic autoencoding and decoding. Sorry. 
So uh, the first study that in order to assess this information, I took that, uh, okay, I'm, I do have my knowledge. I do have my knowledge resources that I actually infused into the, uh, I do uh, use the knowledge to infuse, uh, sorry, I do know, use the knowledge into infusing the model. Initially, uh, what if I don't have my knowledge, I take a very good large feature set. I take all the features that are available online, psycholinguistics, uh, 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 word net uh, linguistic uh, vocabularies and many other vocabularies that you built over the time. You big a large uh, feature set and that's what the study is focusing on. They wanted to classify the societal risk by taking the large feature set. And if I put that model into use, which they have themselves have reported is like 30% in false alarms. And when I'm putting my model into this process and I added the, uh, the knowledge is simply the description of concept classes. So my K over here is just concept classes, the one which I identified. I indications, ideations, behavior, and attempt. I get a 4% in my false alarm by integrating that information seamlessly into the model. If I add more information to it, let's say I bring a DSM-5 associated clarifications that what exactly is suicide risk, what is ideation, what is not, if I add as, as a constraint or some kind of additional or more information to describe what these conditions looks like, I get 3% reduction. That means I'm adding, I'm making my classes more richer and richer over the time. If I, if someone has a domain specific ontology, which I, in this case, I use the drug abuse, a drug abuse ontology being constructed at AI Institute, I am able to get 2.5% reduction in my false alarm. But if I, strangely, all of these things happen just with a random forest, not even with a complicated CNN model or a statistical AI framework. But if I take their CNN model simply by their approach, I'm by itself, I'm getting 1.12% in a false alarm, which is approximately 94% correct accuracy in terms of classifying a suicide risk. And you see over the time, I'm just adding more and more information that does occurs comes with a simple cost about some kind of a generalization that I will talk very late in the, in the presentation. So what do we learn through the, this uh, process? We learn that the post and the concept classes bring context sensitivity in the model. Uncertainty can be controlled by tuning the knob, and that also brings the interpretations as well. Explainability is achieved by analyzing the weight matrix. As I showed you through interpreting by tuning the knob of the data, you can include and you can on and off your knowledge infusion process into your model. So with this approach, I address the context sensitivity, handles uncertainty. I'm able to bring interpretations into the model because now you can tune it and now and user level explainability because I'm holding the spirit of the concept classes all throughout my semi, semi deep infusion as well as shallow infusion. The semi deep also takes help from the shallow infusion in getting user level explainability. In this process, what I have done so far is talked about the classification task and I'm keeping the spirit of the concept classes again. If I look at this process, I'm looking into the now a next stage of language generation same domain of mental health we i take the concept classes again these concept classes are the same which use in shallow infusion and semi deep infusion now rather than giving them by the definitions i'm i'm governing them by the series of questions because generators are good sentence generators they are good question generators so we need to bring that information or we need to mold the problem into their territory so what we know that every of these classes are represented by these questions uh, and yes and no are the responses to all of these questions. Now, if you look at these questions, these questions have a particular process. First of all, person is like, have you ha has the subject wished he was dead or wished he could go to sleep and do, uh, do not wake up? If you look at the uh, post, it was mentioning sleep forever. That means for that, for this particular post, it will come on, coming out to be a particular yes for me. That means if I take the same post and if I match these posts to these questions, that particular answer is coming out to be yes. And so remaining certain, uh, uh, certain responses to these questions are coming out to be no, because there's no particular information or phrase that I can pick from the same passage that matched to that particular question. Hence the idea, hence ideation was given as an outcome. Now, if you look at these questions, if you look at these questions, they are in process. That means they have a yes and no. That means they occur as a tree. That means a very simple approach to do it is to model this information as a decision tree. Sorry. So this is uh, just an ex uh, uh, illustration of how this tree was constructed using this resource. If you look at like uh, first two and three question, if yes to two, ask three, four, five, and six. 
So that means there is a tree structure being constructed in this in this uh, questionnaire. If you have a tree structure, definitely you are learning with the decision tree. And the decision tree, a very simple equation to learn it is the probability of the time it is giving a correct response into the probability of time it is taking the yes path or it is taking the no path of it. And if I look at the intrinsic property of taking the yes and no path, it can only judge by through some similarity measures. What I'm trying to do is I'm bringing the small similarity measure in this case, which is I take the same post and I look at isolate myself and see forever this P sub, this part of the post gets matched to these particular questions. And that's why you get an answer yes, because the similarity of these two posts are coming out to be very high and very close to each other. So that was one example, but what's the outcome? The outcome of this model is very interesting. Since you have a tree as an outcome of this model, the output is a sequence, which is if a person is, if this is a post that is being given to the model, the output is coming out to be a sequence of one, two, and three. And the fourth point is, will always be a label. That means you get a flow chart as an outcome, which is itself is user level explainable. That means you can understand why this particular sequence was followed. This sequence is coming because I'm having a constraint on yes and no in that uh, decision tree model. And when I gave this outcome to a, a model or to a annotators experiment, we took the Excel net as the baseline, which is a very powerful and a very complicated model. And our process, which simply uses uh, any, any deep language model. And in this case, we just use word to vec to be as the language model. And we latched onto the word to vec the decision tree. That means word, word to vec generates a representation and it goes to the decision tree model. It gets an annotation agreement of 70%, which is spectacular, considered the uh, complexity of this problem and that the models are not able to understand the process that is that a clinician would follow exactly the process that a model is following over here. So this process knowledge, the, the, the structure of this process knowledge is identified to be contextual. They are, they are diverse. All of the questions are different. They are semantically related to each other and they have a particular logical order because there's a process. So far, what I told you that the, you gave a model, the model generates a particular label as an outcome. And if it gives a label as an outcome, that means it's still a classification problem, right? And we are dealing with the generation problem, right? We are generating questions, right? We are generating sentences. What if I can train the model somehow to capture these properties of process knowledge, which are contextual and diversity, semantic relatedness, and logical order. If I bring that, I can actually make a model that can generate those questions that the, exactly in the same order as a clinician would, uh, would follow. But there are certain tricks to that. If I can just take off the shelf model as it stands currently, I take any Excel net or any deep language model and generate the questions. I entered the same problem, which I talked about in the very beginning that the generated questions would not be safe because they, there's no way to understand whether the generated questions are acceptable or not acceptable. What if I add a simple piece of information called a retriever? which is we all know uh, is very simple as a concept of information retrieval. We add a retriever. The retriever retrieves the passages from online. So you give a post as an input, the retriever captures all the passages and these passages are relevant to your input and your model trains on this retriever. That means it is becoming context sensitive. It is capturing the context because it is only turning on those concepts which are relevant to your uh, uh, to the post or to the input post. Now there are various ways of doing it. The TF-IDF is a very simple way. Hyperlinks, if there's a hyperlinks in your post, you can learn by hyperlinks. You can connect multiple passages if there's a hyperlink associated between those passages. Or you can learn by maximizing in a product search, which is a fantastic invention uh, by Facebook. Uh, and it's been shown in this paper of Levi's. But when you capture the context, that's also a very good job of doing uh, generating the questions because you're capturing the context by retrieving process. If the question doesn't match the outcome, you are doing a backprop and uh, generating a new questions. But in all this process, you cannot have semantic relations between the questions. You cannot have logical order in the questions. That means you can capture the context, but you cannot capture semantic relations between the questions because there's no way you can capture. You cannot say that one passage comes after the passage just because it is uh, similar to your post 
you cannot rank passages just based on the similarity there has to be some order there has to be some structure to it so what i did was i took a knowledge graph i took a common sense knowledge graph concept net in this case and i tried to bring this concept knowledge graph very very much in like an authoritative fashion to the retriever the retriever only retrieves those informations which are linked to each other in this knowledge graph that means first i generate this subgraph based on the input post the small subgraph and i govern that i govern the retrieval process using this subgraph that means whatever connections that i have associations that i have in my knowledge graph are, are the associations that have been used in retrieving those passages that means my passages are retrieved they are in order because the knowledge graph has this process of traversal when i'm traversing a knowledge from deaf first traversal or breath first traversal prefix or infix or whatever the order i'm taking that's the order i'm having for the retrieval of the passages so that means my passages are retrieved they are semantically related by governing by the knowledge graph but the generated questions are still not in order because generator is generating the questions right it's give, it's getting a passage and it's generating the questions but how do you test that the generated questions are in order right that's another problem to this generation process so what i did was i made a small safety check remember back in the time i was talking i was back in the presentation i was talking about safety checks sanity checks that means i'm checking the model i'm forcing a function we say that if the generated questions currently and the previous generated questions are in are in, have in some kind of an entailment or association or an order then only generate those two questions else retract your generation and this forces the model to have a logical order right so and the best way to check it because i have a, a ground truth which is a process knowledge and the process knowledge has a particular order to it so this constraint looks in a very simple case statement i'm sorry Okay. I paused. So, uh, okay. So what essentially I did was I brought in some case statement into the model. This case statement are the output of the model structure. The case statement says that if the two generated questions Q1 and Q2 are generated by a model, where Q1 can be a Q previous and Q2 is your current question, if the Q2 generation is entails, it does it entails Q1, then I'm learning in a very traditional fashion of cross entropy laws. That means I'm matching it with the outcome and going back. But if those information do not are do not follow a particular order then i'm introducing a new loss which is a reverse cross entropy loss i'm reversing the cross entropy structure that means that particular generation this match didn't happen this i'm penalizing this particular match that means i'm not forcing the model to generate this and one minus the probability of saying that tells me that the generated questions is not the desired question that means the q2 is not uh, following Q1. That means Q2 can either be a neutral question, that means it will it can be the same question as Q1, that's a neutral, or it either can contradict Q1. Uh, that means this question is not in the process and it is uh, doing something, uh, some negation concept into it, into some information. So it's just there's no particular order to it. So with this approach, what I did was I took a simplified query. I'm just simplifying it for visualization purposes. Uh, I took this uh, particular post. Uh, on a person saying I'm trouble concentrating, I have a trouble in reading newspaper, I have a trouble in watching television, and I took a baseline generator T5. We all are aware of it's a very complicated and state of the art model, and this is the process that it has generated. That first ask the question symptoms. I'm matching these because I have a process knowledge, and that's how I'm matching it. I have symptoms, I have symptoms, and I have clarifications. Why I'm asking clarification after I have identified symptoms. So the better process that I have identified is symptoms than cause. You match cause and symptoms together and you end up with asking a diagnostic questions. And more importantly, there is a restriction in the amount of questions being generated in here. 
there's no restriction on the amount of questions that are being generated over there because the generation is triggered by the knowledge graph and the knowledge graph can be as long as extensive as it can so this process structure is very powerful because now you're not only controlling your model from inside but simultaneously making it self-explainable it is giving you a particular process structure that it is following in generating a particular series of questions so far you have generated questions in your models you have identified conversational tasks where the questions questions are generated but none of those question generation processes have a particular process so this is where the idea of uh, process knowledge came into the picture so with this i showed that with classification and generative models both you can achieve context sensitivity handles uncertainty have interpretable models and they are user level explainable in in itself so with this i summarize my technical contributions for my phd defense which is I'm super excited about. And the first thing is capturing the context by introducing concept classes. These are the concept classes coming outside the model and being supporting of the model from outside. Now you have knowledge attention matrix as an another phenomena that can integrate inside the model, which can bring handles uncertainty and it can bring model interpretations. And now we have a process knowledge into the picture that is making better explanations and the model is self explainable now and with this all together i'm putting together knowledge context controller and generation process which is process controlled question generation a new set of approach for conversational information seeking and conversational tasks and along these processes i have made uh, a huge tremendous contribution to the research community on ai and natural language understanding by giving you a series of tasks which I under, uh, which I call name as knowledge induced intensive uh, language understanding and these tasks are all extensive in terms of explainability and interpretability and they challenge AI that without the knowledge it's not possible to achieve state of the art models and make it more explainable and interpretable. And with this, there is certain things always a good research starts with something that is you missed or you have ignored that defines your future research directions as well. So there are some concerns associated with knowledge infusion. The first one is extrapolation or overgeneralization. That means that means the model, when you add knowledge to it, irrespective of output or inside, there is a generalized overgeneralization issues. For example, a very fascinating example that I took, your mom and dad are toxic. I understand my mom and dad has a association, their parents, but toxic is not radioactive. My mom and dad cannot be radioactive, right? So definitely this is a challenge to the knowledge AI that what words suit best. You can identify the context, which of those words suits the best for that particular moment. That's where the AI needs to look for. Another is a disparity. She has her boundaries for a reason, but if I use my approach that I showed about uh, the uh, knowledge infused learning, I'm, my model conflicts that it identify bounds and limits of the two words for which one to choose purpose or cause of the two words are relevant, but which words to choose to paraphrase the sentence. So these are the low two paraphrasing tasks, which are very much centric to knowledge intensive language understanding. This is very simple for a human to do it, but the model with the knowledge as well, there's certain, it can get you through these posts, but which word to choose is the problem. So there's a disparity associated problem as well. So in this direction, I'm making further, I'm putting my further research questions which aligns with the idea of deep infusion where i would like to say that we know that uh, neural models are learning by abstractions and which layer of the neural network requires knowledge and how much knowledge infusion is required or is need to happen to orient the representation i'm pretty much sure if you can answer these two questions or if we can together answer these questions we can solve the problem of overgeneralization or extrapolation of the neural network models because by answering the first two questions you can understand what exactly a concept a particular neuron in the neural network is learning and if a concept that a particular neuron is learning is not relevant to your concept your, your task you can remove unwanted neurons and that's what i'm talking about as a deterministic dropout so these are my uh, thesis publications that i that are relevant to the research that i talked about today and with this, I want to share my experience, my journey 
uh, through a PhD and my PhD from Noisa Center back in Ohio to AI Institute. And uh, I would, I'm really cherished about this, uh, uh, to share this information, but I want to start with, I want to end with something very much important, which is the knowledge infused learning that I built, that I showed to you is a science. And I'm glad that over the time of my research, I became from an engineer to a scientist. But most importantly, the knowledge infused learning is a very powerful tool. It can use, it can help you to become user level, make your model explainable and interpretable. But there's a cause and there's a concern to it. It has to be done with a, with a consciousness because too much of information added to the model can make it to generalize or make it over generalize as well. So knowledge infused learning is definitely a powerful tool for better user level explainable uh, and uh, interpretable artificial intelligence. So my PhD sums up uh, with uh, publications uh, where I did uh, in all top tier computer science conferences across in AI and natural language processing, information retrieval and recommender systems. Uh, I built over my PhD, I built a lot of resources. I cannot show all of them, but I did some of them which, I'm, uh, which have more than thousands to 2000 downloads as of now. And I had a, uh, because of my advisor, I had a chance of serving as a co-editors of two books and serving as an application track chair of some conferences. And thanks to U of SC2 for nominating me for the Breakthrough uh, Research Awards as well. As also for the technical outreach of my research, which is very much important and I learned because of my advisor, Dr. Sheth here, is that I, I, I got involved in tutorials, uh, giving my teachings about my research on knowledge infused learning in various top uh, computer science conferences. I'm also organized and routinely will organizing uh, knowledge infused mining and learning and knowledge infused learning workshops and the coming up the subsequent coming up is on the ACM CIKM 2022 and I have been uh, invited talks I have given invited talks about my research uh, in various organizations as well as institutions and my, my research is also covered in a podcast uh, by UBI AI and chaos or orchestra. And the most important thing is the learning. And what's better way to learn than just working on the grant proposals. And this have been the most pivotal research experience. I have never been so sweaty in my research as I was when I was writing a proposals, <laughs> mostly because there's no end to it, right? There's, it's a completely well structured, unstructured, and it's you eventually happens at the last day of your submissions. Right, so, but I'm grateful to all these collaborators and partners who I made during my journey of my PhD. And the, uh, the grants that I received are the grants that I collaborated with Dr. Sheth and Dr. Shalin, Dr. Hobbs, Dr. Shivastav, and, and Dr. Prasad, and Dr. Patak, and Dr. Das as well, and Dr. Narasimhan, and everyone uh, who I have collaborated, and the wider portfolios of proposals that were, cons that were constructed as a part of my PhD research. Also, I would like to thank, uh, this is a small map of my journey from my, for my PhD. I changed institutions a lot and, uh, and I have worked with various research labs as well. And my internships came from like SRI, Telecom Paris Tech, Samsung Research. And I'm also grateful to all the fellowships that I have uh, received during the part of my PhD. I was fortunate to mentor uh, some spectacular students over the time. And they have been, I just made a trace mark of, I was sitting alone and I was thinking, what should I do? The best way to represent of mentors, uh, the students are, they actually made me work from IST to PDT to EDT and to GMT, all the time zones. And, uh, and I am fortunate that they are doing very well in their research as of now. So I went, so my, my mentorship started from high school to uh, PhDs to master students, as well as early PhD students as well. And finally, thanks to my amazing committee members who always supported me in my endeavors, what I achieved, what I did as a part of my research, and uh, whatever mentorships and proposals I did, I wrote, I contributed. And uh, it has not been possible if I would not have these guys next to me and next to my shoulder. And also I would thanks to my mentors who have been, who are past PhD students 
and as well as industry folks who are there in spite of comp after completing my internships i routinely interact with them and they have been a part of my uh, my journey my part of my success part of my review processes and they have been part of the criticism that i also face when i show them my research and finally thanks to you guys for silently and patiently listening to me uh, listening to my uh, defense and it's always great to be next to your friends because they are the distractions because you need distractions in research because research is not a simple structured process it's all about motivation self management perseverance and the ability to make it through thank you all now i open to any questions and yeah this is just a thanks about me that phd is an ultra marathon and i am an ultra marathoner So apart from mental health, I have uh, exp I have utilized these approaches on various other domains. As I talked about, uh, I I did uh, study the conversational problem, the generation problem in clinical diagnostic interviews. I talked about I studied this information crisis informatics. Uh, when uh, when you have like for example, when you have a tweet streams coming in, a very important task for any emergency responder is to identify which event is happening and which event is originating some of the events you are know of you are very much familiar but some of the events are emerging they are come you don't have any knowledge but you have those knowledge in your past experiences which are archives if i can bring that information and can analyze the tweets i can get a short summary of how this information looks like and that was my one of my uh, other work on knowledge infusion to study the sub event extraction in dynamic uh, crisis uh, crisis tweet streams Yes, Regina. Sorry. Yes. that's a that's a fantastic question actually that was one of my concern in this case so essentially what i figured out was that it's better to retrieve while training the model but if the questions if if, if for example now if you have a two different domains right then certainly you need to train the model in two different domains but if the if the domain is same if the domain is consistent throughout then you don't need to train the model it is very much transferable across the different tasks so i didn't show the experiments on that but i was uh, very much happy with this that i trained my model on wiki news it did spectacular on wikipedia it did spectacular on web documents as well so i i didn't show that result but yeah uh, ac across the domains if the domains have some similarity that means if i'm talking about news whether i'm talking about wiki news or bbc news or new york times the model will work fine the only process that it needs is that the the outcome should have a particular summary structure that means uh, the annotators have to provide us or the experts have to provide us what type of questions are they seeking if they have a process then i can we can generate a series of questions So in that case, uh, that's also another question that I'm, I didn't go into the technical part of it, but uh, I found, so in my model that I showed you today, there are two variants of it. 
one variant is a token level generation another is a sentence level generation so what i showed you the results the outcome was on a token level generation so i know what are the words that are coming next but i had difficulties in performance but still i'm best with the with the state of the art but there is a difficulty when i'm generating sentences because in sentences it's very difficult to maintain that the if i'm doing word by word i know the sentence will be linguistically correct but if i'm doing sentence by sentence that's where i'm losing the order of the words that's that's the problem that i'm having Mm -hmm. so what's the difference between English software and that? Come again? Uh, like, uh, if uh, software has been incorporated, knowledge is incorporated. Okay. And uh, what is that one thing? And that's incorporated in English. I didn't get you again. Uh, so you're, you're uh, let me rephrase it. So are you asking me that the generated, so uh, I'm talking about the, so once the shallow infusion, is about the infusion of the knowledge from outside. The semi-deep is about the infusion infusion from the inside, right? Uh, what's your question about? Oh, okay, okay. There's no difference in the input structure. The input is whatever you want to, uh, all of these structures are perfectly fine on the unstructured as well as structured documents. Yes. But like, why do I have it? All those information like from Twitter, from Google, from Google, okay. And um, trying to understand from where it is coming from, mm -hmm. how do you do it? Where do you know that it is coming from this structure? That's a good thing. So, what hap when happen is that. Uh, the in a very simple sense, if I want to explain you, uh, we know that AI in a very simple sense have similarity as its construct, right? You can have similarity, you can have distance measures, right? So essentially, what you do is that you there's a two types of sim. I'm just simplifying the things. So there's two uh, important concepts. So one is your hard match, which you are saying that exact the, the word that is present in your tweet matches with the exact word. In this information now the interesting thing is that these the words that these people are using or whatever the word this radicalization process or hate speech or the other info the word that they use are not the word which everyone uses in their day-to-day -day, uh, uh, communications these words come from a particular vocabulary they are governed by some information that they read for example if you if you say that uh, I'm, I'm talking about this particular concept this particular concept came from a particular book you read if I'm bringing that book, if I know that book, then only I can understand what exactly you're talking about. Because whatever information you are having right now is partially observed to me, right? I don't know the trail from where that particular information is coming from. So I need to understand which corpuses were used to understand this information. And these people use, when, I, when, the, when I'm talking about radicalization, white supremacy, or all of uh, this complex phenomenon on social media, there's a particular linguistic structure to that. The structure comes from a resource. So that's why I have to bring that resource into the model. Anyone else? Have you considered to use knowledge into knowledge image data? That's a very good point. Uh, I did actually. And that's why the this point that I said about uh this me. This point that by understanding the concept of a neuron, by, uh, by understanding that the concept a neuron has learned is important, this is where I, that is coming from a computer vision background. So these are, I'm pretty much sure everyone are, agree with it, that the research in computer vision is far ahead of the research in non-natural language understanding. And the research in, uh, in, uh, in computer vision has, there's a work on it that talks about if you can understand the concept within the neurons, right? What exactly a concept a neuron has learned you can understand whether you should pick the neuron or whether you should remove it. Language models are currently all the rage for vision. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Um, uh, Leoti is actually uh, pursuing that exactly. Actually. 
if it ever comes to logging into the database, you may be screwing with this. And yeah, interestingly, if you if you come across with that work, that work very much aligns with the semantic auto encoding structure that I defined. The the structure, the, the mathematical formulation of both approaches are, uh, are similar. Yes, Akshay, sir. Ask you a question, and I, I know we may get a chance to talk later. Ask it. <laughs> but the question which I had was, uh, you were working with open domain data and open domain knowledge, right? And there is a lot of concern about uh, poisoning or uh, wrong information being put deliberately in this. And uh, with uh, what is your thought about working with knowledge inclusion but working around these kind of poisoning? That's a very interesting point as well. So I I actually did I talked about that and I want to quote over here. I talked about that in the deception uh, proposal that I we just uh, worked on. So in that proposal, uh, the, the process of this wrong information, Dr. Shivasa, uh, is not, uh, you cannot consider them as a binary or a multi-class or a multi-label problem. It's a process, right? It's a process of how you construct these information. How do you make them deceptible? For example, if I, if I make any claim about something and if I hide all its resources online, there's no way to verify this claim is true or not. Right, so definitely, if you have any archive, any information in the background, that's where you can verify it. So the poisoning can be tested if there is a resource that can verify the fact of it. Wikipedia is definitely not that source because Wikipedia is edited by by the people. But if there is an archive, for example, in, in my crisis informatics problem, if I want to mold it, some of the tweets that were, were given were wrongful tweets, but they do not match to the archives. The archive is FEMA identified were important, the Federal Emergency Management Agency. They gave that this is the process where I analyze the event during a crisis. And if that process doesn't follow the same tweet structure that I'm getting, probably I will flag it that this tweet is not relevant to me. I can label it as relevant and not relevant, but dealing with why this is particular is irrelevant is a, is a different challenging task in itself. And I'm not sure about uh, which sort of knowledge would help it. Uh, until uh, one thing I'm sure that if I, if I, you ask me to give it a bit best shot, then the best shot would be coming from an archives. I have yes, we shall. So initially, uh, you talked about in the uh, area of question generation, uh, you talked about how you have a module which prevents uh, asking uh, unsafe questions or irrelevant questions. Yeah. And uh, you also talked about how there's the issue of overgeneralization with the first two uh, infusion, knowledge infusion methods that you talked about. Yes. And possibly how deep infusion might overcome that. Mm -hmm. So, what is your idea on using uh, the similar module which prevents concepts which might not be entirely related to uh, whatever is the um, discussion being? Or mm -hmm. whatever is the context in in the sentence that we are looking at okay and in that way really actually might be completely eliminated because uh, yes yes but that that's where i'm uh, so if i'm if i'm using uh concept net right or dbpd or wiki data let's say they are not meant by this problems these problems are came when people started to look at paraphrasing if I, if i if i look at this uh so you know that this problem actually didn't came from this uh, Microsoft paraphrase corpus. No, this corpus is very much clear, clean. The issue came from this user language paraphrase corpus that this gave developed by domain experts. And that's where they told that people don't use toxic to radioactive. So that information was given as a label to it. That means that the model has no way to identify toxic and radioactive are two are not similar things. The, the context where it is being used, that is important. I cannot say, I can say that the, this uh, a house near a nuclear plant can be a radioactive scenario. It can be a toxic, uh, the toxic air, the air can be toxic, the place can be radioactive. The two use is fine, but not in the context of parents and mom and dad. So that's why, so they actually add that as a separate label. Uh, that's where I know it. And that's why I, I made it as a point that this is an open question for an AI. I can go to uh, uh, toxic and radioactive as a two words. But there's no way to distinguish which one is to better to use. Okay, thank you very much. Um, we'll uh, then now have uh, I, I just have. Uh, we'll move
go to the committee or uh, you know i just have one question to answer which is from dr patak i said okay. i think uh is can you explain explain the difference between indication and ideation yes uh, so social indication was something that uh, was added to cssrs the columbia society Civil rating scale here and ai institute where we have repeated conversations with dr nara simon and susan hartman where we talked about that indication is is something that that drives a person from no risk to social ideation so it's a, it's a stable state in the middle just to keep a check if an indication is there, there's a possible the uh, there's a possibility the person drift to a next case. So it's a it's a kind of a stable point that we added just to check that we are holding on the person who has a chance in the future to go to ideation. So that's why it's not a part of the CSSRS. Are you done? Yes. All right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.